I'm Rachel Romeliotis, a senior editor at O'Reilly, and I'm at OzCon 2013 with Steve Holden. Hi. He is general manager of the Open Bastion. Thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Always a pleasure to join O'Reilly. Fantastic. So let's talk Python. Yeah. So tell me about your story, how you got into Python, first of all. Okay. Well, you have to go a long way back. Um, I was always interested in object-oriented systems mm -hmm. from 1973 when I read about the original object-oriented work of Alan Kay's group at Xerox Park. And so when I was back in the UK, I even uh, supervised an implementation of Smalltalk and uh, realized through using the language that it wasn't really my, it didn't fit my brain as we say in the Python world. Mm -hmm. So I kind of gave up on object-oriented programming for a while until I came over to the States and uh, ran into a Python book. And I thought, well, this looks like a really good way to do object-oriented programming. And I was, I was looking around for new technologies at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I would align myself with Python and so I started a 20-year plan to achieve total world domination. Nice. How's it going? Uh, we're about 17 and a half years in now. I think we still have a way to go. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so tell me a little bit. So there's the ongoing sort of um, struggle between Python 2 and Python 3. No, I wouldn't um, describe it as a struggle. But well, maybe a transition? Yes. All right. Yes. Um, tell me a little bit about what you think is happening there and what you think the future is. Yeah. Um, I think essentially uh, the transition is going pretty much as we, as we expected it to. Mm -hmm. um, when Python 2.7 was released, mm -hmm. the development team said that they would, they would keep it under maintenance for at least five years. So oh, okay. people. So people knew that they weren't just going to be abandoned when, when Python 3 came mm -hmm. out. There were a lot of weaknesses in the Python 3 implementation. I think the language definition was sound, but the implementation, certainly for example, the, the I.O. system was extremely slow in mm -hmm. version 3.0. Mm. But things have, have kept getting better, and I think with the 3.3 release, mm -hmm. we're now at the stage where we can say Python 3 is very definitely production ready. Interestingly enough, the development team are now having to, to slow some people down in their migration to oh, three. Yeah. yeah, just because uh, you know, there are certain essential components they need, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. But yeah, um, people are getting the, the Python 3 bit between their teeth. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are organizations who have uh, millions of lines of code in Python 2.7. There's no real reason for them to re-engineer that mm -hmm. unless they're going to re-engineer their product completely so sure. they can still carry on with, with 2.7. So I don't see it as a conflict in any way, but I'm, I'm very pleased with the way Python 3 is now being adopted. And of course, O'Reilly have just published the new uh, Python cookbook yes. by David Beasley yep. and totally uh, Brian 3. Jones, and yep. that's all Python 3. Sure yeah. is, yeah. Um, yeah, and they convinced us to do that. So that Good. Was, yeah, that was well, I, it, was, it was an interesting decision. When I, I had to make the choice, I think, five, four, five years ago about whether O'Reilly School of Technology would teach Python 3 or Python 2. Mm -hmm. And I, I chose Python 3 as well because, without a doubt, it's the future. I mean, sure. It, within a year's time, I think most people who learn Python will probably be learning Python 3 rather than you. Python 2. Totally agree. Yeah. So another interesting area that I'm always uh, thinking about with Python is sort of where it seems to be going. People are using it, you know, with Django for web. Yep. People are using it, you know, for data-driven yep. uh, projects. Can you talk a little bit about where you see it going? And uh, Sure, although, I mean, one of the things about Python is it's so broad in its applicability now, and people are using it for so many things, it's, it's mm -hmm. very difficult to keep track of them all. Um, Python's always excelled as a glue language, so people like the, the film studios, Disney and, uh, and so on, they tend to use it to uh, knit together mm -hmm. their production pipelines where they're doing a lot of high intensity, high computational demand rendering, mm -hmm. but in languages which don't have very good logic expression. So because of its ability to play well with others, it, it wins out in those areas where mm -hmm. a purely interpreted language with no help from compiled languages might not be able to. Um, it's always been strong uh, on the internet and, and particularly in web technologies. Sure. And as you probably know, we've got a number of 
uh, competing web frameworks yep. now in Python, and that's uh, some people thought that that was that was wrong and that we ought to only have one. But mm. I personally see that diversity as, as a good thing because not everybody wants the full heavyweight, you know, Django. Mm. They might prefer to use a pyramid-based system mm -hmm. or a Flask system, sure. which is which is much lighter weight. So I think that we're the fact that we're offering a range of of offerings in any one area is, is a good thing too. I think mm -hmm. that's good for Python. But the really interesting story at the moment is I think in science and engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, with the introduction of the IPython notebook, mm -hmm. suddenly the data scientists have a tool which allows them to present computations and data as a maintained whole. Right. Uh, and allow you to basically to, to maintain your whole uh, your data and your program under source code control so mm -hmm. that you can reproduce it at any time you know the position at the 3rd of January last year was this and you can just pull out right. the appropriate content so I think people have, have realized in the scientific world that uh, in the world of big data particularly you know mm -hmm. sometimes you get people who they they're claiming experimental or, or research results, they can't reproduce the code that they use to, to produce them and they can't reproduce the data that that, that code operated mm -hmm. on. So I think people are, are beginning to realize that tools like the IPython notebook will mm -hmm. help with that. And of course, uh, Python's out in the cloud in a big way, both in, in platform of a service. Mm -hmm. uh, the IPython notebook has some great features for parallel computing so that you can you know, you, you can you can spin up 64 huge Amazon virtuals and have them all working in parallel on your right. numerical problem. So, uh, with the work of companies like Enthought um, and and Continuum, I think we're going to see Python penetrating much more heavily into the worlds of science, engineering, and finance. Yeah, especially with NumPy and SciPy libraries are great, and I guess Blaze is something that's coming out that's new. Oh yeah, I mean it, it's difficult to keep track of all the it technology is. that's coming out in Python sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you th are there any areas that Python hasn't reached yet? Do you think that there's still some? Uh some availability or need for something like Python? I think Python's probably everywhere it needs to be. I yeah, mean, you, yeah. know, you wouldn't write a device driver in Python, for example, something sure. like that. So, um, I mean, people will will be free to disagree with me, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but I uh, I think it's it's about as broadly a, a broadly applied as it, it can yeah. be at the moment. So how about so final question? So yeah. uh, how's the Python community doing? Uh, do you think it's you know inclusive and in helping the language grow? I think it's important to have a great community around the language. Well, right. When I when I started PyCon, the reason I did so was was to try to bring together everybody who was working on Python. The international Python conferences that had been held before. For that mm -hmm. were more like a full grade conference, so mm. they excluded a lot of people who, who couldn't really afford that, that kind of money. So we've always placed an emphasis on community in the Python world. And even though, I mean, the Python Software Foundation is a very small organization, mm -hmm. it can't really hope to, to represent the whole community without um, being enlarged somehow. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the, the change in chairmanship, well, I, I left last year and Van um, Lindbergh took over. Mm -hmm. Now Van is revamping the membership system so that uh, anyone who's interested in Python will be able to, to become a member of the Python Software Foundation. So we're aiming at being more inclusive. Cool. Uh, we're also continuing to, to beat the diversity drum. Very important to get more women into Python, mm -hmm. uh, more racial diversity, more gender diversity of mm -hmm. all types, you know. Just basically, um, I'm, I'm currently trying to, to persuade the open source world as a whole that we need more diversity in terms of occupation as well. We could do with you know, not just geeks, but people who are good at uh, writing documentation, people who are good at filing, people who are good at administration. Mm -hmm. you know, as, as a project gets larger, it needs more of these these kind of things to support it. So that was what I tried to do in, in my time as chairman of the Python Software Foundation was turn the foundation into an organization that could support a large membership, which, which hopefully will keep the community cohesive Absolutely. as we go forward. I know back where I'm from, there's a, a, a Python group that's 3,600 people. 
So, Boston? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, and the Duver Ned Batchelder's group is yes, very well very indeed. Very good. And I, I, PyCon 2013, I was there. Also uh -huh. great. So I think. Pi Stunning conference, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. Yeah, great group of people. Jesse so, Nola did a huge job there. Yeah, so um, thank you very much for stopping by and talking to me. That's a pleasure, Rachel. Great to see you again.